says, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Um, would you bow your heads with me? Um, we just want to welcome you into this service. Um, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would come today, that you would bless this service, um, that you would bless Pastor Matt as he is um, taking on more leadership in this church, Father. Um, I just thank you for him and his heart, um, and I just ask that we would truly worship you today and that everything we do would be about you, that you would prepare our hearts for the week ahead, and that we would just glorify you in everything we do, Father. Bless this time, bless these people. Um, we love you, Lord. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Give his 
might not know me. My name's Chuck Johnson. I'm one of the elders here. I do wish you good morning and welcome to Faith Baptist Church and our services here, here this morning. This is a very special time and you are fortunate and blessed to be here and will be. Thank you for joining us together for, and thank you all for joining us on media and watching uh, at home as well. This morning, as I mentioned, is a special but yet at the same time it's a, a historic occasion for our church family because as we join together in our Lord Jesus Christ together through songs and scripture and sermons we will also at the same time being uh, installing Pastor Matt as our lead pastor that's a, a joyous occasion for us so welcome welcome to you each one let us ask God now to bless our time together with him let us pray our Father and God, we, we do indeed adore you for who you are and for all that you've done for us, especially to this local body of believers. We humbly request, Lord, that you accept our thanks and praise during this time. 
We thank you for meeting us here today for this special occasion and for the opportunity for worshiping you. We dedicate every part of this service to you, Father, asking that the great shepherd of the sheep will be clearly seen, lovingly worshiped, and faithfully obeyed. For his name's sake we pray, amen. Pastor Jim. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Well, I welcome everyone here this morning. We're excited you're here. This is a great day for uh, Faith Baptist Church. <clears throat> I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at uh, verse 1 on down to verse 12. In, uh, in the text here, Paul is evaluating his ministry and what he has went through. And uh, let's uh, stand in reverence to God's word. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter four, verse one. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, ourselves as bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the holy, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to the death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Christ also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. And then also I'd like for you to turn to 1 Timothy. Chapter four, verse 16. This is uh, Pastor Matt's uh, favorite verse and uh, has really meant a lot to him over the years in serving the Lord. First Timothy chapter four, verse 16. And this is Paul giving counsel to a young pastor in the text here. In verse 16 of chapter four, it says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. You may be seated. Good morning. 
Uh, for those of you who don't, don't know me, my name is Aaron Burak. I'm a deacon here at Faith and served as the chairman of the pulpit committee. And it's on their behalf that I'm here to speak to you just to give you a brief overview of kind of what led us uh, to get to this day. Um, but before I do that, I do want to just kind of point out and recognize the other members that helped in this, uh, this process on the pulpit committee. Um, those people were uh, Chuck Johnson, uh, Glenn Horn, Jim Rupp, Bruce Kreidler, Clay Hudipult, Kurt Wendling, Dan Hauser, Alvin Chang, and John Panko. Uh, I'm so thankful for each and every one of these men um, and what they brought. Uh, input and great passion for doing this, and it was just a pleasure to work with each and, what, each and every one of you, and I, and I thank you each. Um, whatever the expectation or thoughts that each of these men brought in this committee, uh, we each had the sole purpose of having God lead us through this process. Um, we didn't want our personal thoughts or feelings or expectations to get in the way of, of praying and letting God lead us to the correct decision. Um, and it's amazing looking back now uh, over these many months, um, and that's exactly what's happened at every step of the way, and we're so thankful for, to him for that. Um, starting out, we obviously had a very unique situation uh, with a long-term associate pastor. Um, some, some very obvious decisions could have been made quickly, but we, we felt it was very important to go through the process and to, uh, to make sure that, that he or any other potential candidate um, met all the biblical criteria to lead this church. Um, and obviously there we started with 1 Timothy 3, um, which lays out the guidelines for an overseer or pastor. Um, so just a few of those, there are many things listed. I'm not going to list them all and bore you. Uh, I'm going to just list out a couple of these and just kind of feel how we felt ma measured up. Um, it says he must be above reproach. Uh, I don't think that's ever been a question or even a rumor of anything with Matt's reputation. He's um, of the utmost integrity and character. Um, he must be hospitable. Um, I think that's one of Matt's great strengths. Um, he goes out of his way to make time for people. He cares deeply for the well-being of others, um, both in his welcoming people to his home and welcoming, just taking time for people, and it's, uh, it's very evident. He must be able to teach. Um, very important, obviously, with the pastor, and it's, it's been so exciting uh, over this last year, year and a half, as Matt has, uh, we, situations have arrived where he's spent more time in the pulpit and it's seen the tremendous growth in his uh, preaching ability and we've just been so impressed with the depth of his preparation and the very practical applications that we see every week that he gives to us that we can use in our daily lives uh, and then he also must manage his family well um, i think that's very obvious uh, you look at his children who are actively living for the lord and serving him you know, whether it's up here on stage or in the youth group, um, that's a direct um, example of Matt's leadership and Krista's leadership um, to the family. I could go on at every single point that's listed in that passage, and I, I mean, trust me, he meets, meets every one. Um, in addition to Timothy, down in First Timothy, um, the group was also looking specifically for someone who could really have a heart for shepherding and who would really love and care for this flock of believers. Um, Matt's love for people, and specifically the, the people of the Baptist Church, is clearly evident in everything he does. Uh, even just through this process, being able to see a little bit more behind the scenes, just watching Matt and watching his heart break for people who have been going through struggles, or who have lost a loved one, or have sickness, it's just, you, you, you see it up front, but you, you see it from behind. It's, um, he has a heart for each and every one of you. And on the flip side, when someone needs, something exciting happens in your life, he's always the first one to reach out and, and be your biggest cheerleader and be your biggest encouragement. Um, it's just been wonderful to see, um, perceive this even more in depth in this process. He has over 25 years of, of loving on this specific group of believers. And it's clear he wanted to be here, and he wants great things for this church and for the people that are a part of it. 
So just a little bit, I'm not going to um, go too much in detail, but just in a little bit of the process that we went through, um, after we clearly, uh, you know, locked in on, as our first candidate, um, there's a couple of things that happened then. We started out uh, with the written interview for him. We wanted to give him a chance to um, really take his time and answer some of the questions we had as they all came together with, you know, many questions they thought might be good to ask. Uh, compiled those up and came up to a very small list of 30 questions. Um, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> but there's a wide range of questions from, you know, personal questions to doctrinal issues for his vision for the church uh, and everything in between. Um, and what was I was personally impressed with, he didn't shy away from a single one of them. Um, extremely thorough and thoughtful, thought out answers. Um, I think when I got when he emailed it back to us, I think there was 12 pages of answers. I was like, he definitely took his time and did a great job. Um, but it, it really gave us a deeper insight into his thoughts and beliefs more than just what we had already known. Uh, after that, we did follow up with an in-person interview. Uh, we, set, we tried to set it for an hour, hour and a half. Uh, we had a great conversation. I think we ended up over two plus hours uh, just talking and, and, and hearing each other. Uh, being able to ask follow-up questions, clarifying questions. Um, it was just a great time um, to, to get to, to know him better and to know his heart better. Um, it came across that, came out of that very impressed. Um, following that, we came together uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, it was very exciting that each one of us came back with the same, same thoughts, um, that we were very happy with everything. It confirmed everything we, we thought we had already known, and we voted that day unanimously to that we wanted to present Matt as the first to call him as the pastor. Um, so we did make that announcement uh, at the subsequent uh, church setting uh, where we um, presented uh, the announcement that we would like to call him. Um, we followed that up with the Q&A time uh, where we came together on a Saturday night, was, was blown away with how many people we came out for, came out for that. It was a great time of fellowship and, and conversation and more questions from you all. Um, it was just a, a great time to show the, to feel the excitement that was uh, just in the air in regards to what was coming. And, um, and all that process led us to, um, to the recommendation that we brought up in the special business meeting that we had. And I want to read the, the recommendation that, that we did make to you on the day that we voted for Matt. That recommendation was, the pulpit committee recommends that Pastor Matt Otto be called to be the new lead pastor of Faith Baptist Church. We took the vote after that and tallied it, and um, the Lord blessed us with over 97% uh, voting yes, that that's what we wanted. And trust me, I know it would have been even higher. I know there's several people that wanted to be here and couldn't be here. Uh, it's just, just amazed at um, the unity shown and the excitement shown in the trust that we were all putting in Matt. Um, we're just so thankful that, that God led us through this, and we're so excited that for the future of Faith Baptist Church that it will have now under the new leadership of Pastor Matt Otto. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for um, Dr. Dave Warren um, to, to you this morning. Um, he will be bringing the challenge to the church, to us. Um, in And uh, he graduated from Cedarville in 1964 and Dallas Seminary in 1968 in Hebrew. Pastor, he pastored Champion Baptist Church. In Warren, Ohio in 1968 to 1976, taught at Faith Baptist Bible College, Ankeny, Iowa in 1976 to 1980, taught at Cedarville University from 1980 to 1998. I received an honorary doctorate from Grand Rapids Baptist Seminary in 1997. 
He and his wife, Pat, have authored three publications for Regular Baptist Press. And he served as state representative for the Ohio Association of Regular Baptist Churches in 1998 to 2016. Uh, served as trustee at Cedarville University and currently resides in Cedarville, Ohio. Has four adult children and 13 grandchildren. Dr. Warren. <laughs> Good morning, and it is my privilege to be with you. It's been a long time since I've been here, actually. As a matter of fact, I thought, now, who will be here that I recognize? And I thought, well, I need to find Krista. <laughs> I hadn't seen her in a long time, but Matt was standing beside this blonde, and he was holding her hand. So I decided that must be Krista. <laughs> And Dick and Gloria Dayton and I go back a long time, probably more years than I care to say in public. But uh, I'm just very privileged to be here today, and I thank you for that opportunity that you've given to me. The text of the morning for this challenge to the uh, church is Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Acts 20, 28, if you'll join me there in your copy of scripture or on your device, Acts 20 and verse 28. <clears throat> it would be wisest for me, I think, simply to read it for you, and I may read it twice, just to allow it to sink into our, our thinking. Acts 20, verse 28. The Apostle Paul said to the Ephesian elders of his day, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has obtained with his own blood. I'll read that again, if you will. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he has obtained with his own blood. Now this is a challenge to you. Uh, Pastor Dayton will give a challenge to the candidate, to Matt, Matt himself. But what I have to say is aimed directly at uh, each one of you and all of you. Now I'm of the opinion that next to the relationship of a husband to his wife, the most beautiful human relationship is that of a pastor to his people. Pastor to people. There's really nothing like it, as I said, except husband and wife. It's also my opinion that if you as a congregation, as collectively and individually, that if you as a congregation will, this may not sound real good at first, if you will heed what I am about to say to you, that the relationship you have with Matt and Krista Otto will be not only beautiful, but it will also be long-term. And that's what I really want for them and for you. Now, I have to be a little careful here because my charge is to the congregation, not to the candidate. And so I dare not steal any of Dick Dayton's thunder. I can't do that. And he and I have not conferred as to what he's about to do, and he has no clue what I'm about to do. Neither do I. <clears throat> But a pastor, as you, I hope you know, a pastor is a shepherd. That's what the term pastor means. And so I read in the, in the text, shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And so my, uh, my mind asked the question, uh, what does a shepherd do? What is a shepherd supposed to do? 
And I think you will agree with me that a shepherd is a person who is to lead, he is to feed, and he is to guard. That's what shepherds do. They lead, they feed, and they guard. However, this challenge is not to the shepherd. <laughs> My challenge is to the sheep. So it follows logically, and I think it also follows, more importantly, biblically, that if your pastor is to lead, that means that you are to be leadable. If he is to lead, you are to be leadable. What good is a leader if no one is willing to follow? Or as that old expression says, where he leads me, I will follow. So your task as individuals and as a congregation is to, lead, is to be leadable and to follow the lead that uh, Matt gives to you. Now some of you may say, but Brother Warren, I really don't like him. I really don't like his wife, Krista, and those kids. <clears throat> no way. Now, I know I'm only talking to 3%. That's okay. I, I was listening very carefully about the uh, tally of that vote. <laughs> I hope you sense I'm only teasing with you. But the truth is, if you have a pastor who wants to lead you in ways that are biblical and in ways that are within the bounds of your constitution, then there is no good reason not to follow him. And so if a pastor is to lead, that means the congregation is to follow, is to be leadable. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul said on three different occasions in the New Testament. Once to folks who were extremely friendly to Paul, the Philippian church, and twice to folks who were, though his converts, not all that friendly <laughs> to Paul, the Corinthians. But on three different occasions, the Apostle Paul said to a congregation, follow me as I follow Christ. That's your charge, not just from me as a visiting person, but from the author of the New Testament itself. Again, if a pastor is to lead, the implication is that the, the uh, congregation should be leadable and follow his lead. A pastor is to lead. Secondly, a pastor is to feed. That means simply, as, as you know, uh, a shepherd feeding his flock, feeding his sheep. It's kind of a figure simply for teaching, for instructing you. And so it follows reasonably, and I think biblically, that if a pastor is to teach, then the congregation is to be teachable. Come to church on Sundays and on other occasions ready to learn, ready to listen, ready to hear. For if his task from the Lord is to teach you, your task from the Lord is to be teachable. Now for that I take you to Acts 17 for just a moment. I took you to chapter 20. Now look at chapter 17, if you will, for a moment. For when I think of people who were teachable and people who came to church with the right spirit of learning, I always think of the Berean believers 
Acts 17, beginning at verse 10. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word. Now watch this. They are, they are complimented for the way they listened and the way they learned and the way they responded to Paul's instruction. They're complimented for that. These Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. <laughs> these folks were open-minded. That's what that uh, term, that first term um, means. They received the word with all eagerness. They were more noble. That word noble means open-minded. It's hard to be open-minded. These folks had never met Paul before. They didn't have a clue as to who he was, and the message he delivered was brand new and very different. And yet they heard it. They listened. And Luke also uses the term eager. They, they were eager to hear what he had to say. In our, in our culture, we would say they were sitting on the edge of their seat. They were just ready. It was almost as if uh, he would say, stop the music, get the announcements, give me the sermon. Woo we are here to learn. Wow, they were eager. Is that how you come? <laughs> Open-minded, eager-minded, but then they didn't just take everything he said as gospel truth. During the week, they went home and they opened their own copy of the word and they checked him out. They evaluated what he had to say. They wanted to be sure that uh, they weren't just going to embrace something he said just because he said it. But if indeed what he was teaching was in accord with the scripture, then they embraced that readily and happily, and they thus were teachable. So too the believers in, in Mount Vernon, Ohio. You have a pastor who is to lead. You are to be leadable. You have a pastor who is to teach. You are to be teachable. Pastors lead. Pastors feed. Pastors guard. You think about a shepherd, you, you think about him protecting. You can see a shepherd in your mind's eye with a crook or a staff, some kind of a club, if you will, to fend off enemies. Sometimes those enemies come from the outside of the, of the group. And sometimes, sadly, those enemies can come from within the group. But a pastor's, part of a pastor's task is to guard. And if that's true, that a pastor is to guard the flock, then that means for you that you must be correctable. If the pastor begins to sense that you are moving away or beginning to think in a wrong way or trying to make or perhaps making some choices that really aren't the best or the wisest for you or your family or you as an individual you can expect that pastor to show up and to caution you not because he's angry at you but because as the writer to the hebrews says he is one who is charged to watch for your soul. And he will ultimately give an account to God for the way in which he has guarded you. I think it's hard to be corrected. 
there takes what, what I call, we have to be marked by an honest humility or a humble honesty when a pastor shows up and speaks some words to us of caution or of warning that we don't particularly want to hear. Unless you think I am kind of pushing this too far, come with me to Hebrews 13 for just a moment. Hebrews 13, right at the end of the book there. Hebrews 13, verse 7, and then verse 17, two very similar verses. And they both have to do with this notion of guarding and of being corrected and of being willing to receive correction. Hebrews 13, 7, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then verse 17, similar, but perhaps a little more pointed. <laughs> Obey your leaders and submit to them. Sometimes that word goes down kind of hard in independent American minds. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this, that is, let them give this account with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Kind of, he specializes in understatement there. You really don't want him to report to the Lord something negative about you. A pastor is to lead, therefore the flock is to be leadable. A pastor is to feed or teach, therefore you are to be teachable. Pastor is to guard, therefore you are to be correctable. You see, I'm of the opinion that next to the husband and wife relationship, the most beautiful human relationship going is that of a pastor and his people. And I'm also of the opinion that if you will heed, not simply what I have said just now, but the teaching of the New Testament, if you will heed that, the relationship between you and your new pastor will be not only beautiful, but also long-term. And that's what I want for them and for you. May God Make it so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warren. Reverend Reed. college roommate came to Christ and shared Christ with him. The Lord drew Dick to himself and ultimately directed, directed him from physics to ministry. Dick graduated from Faith Baptist Bible College and Seminary and then pastored in Iowa for 34 years until retirement. And he continues to serve as chaplain with the Iowa State Patrol and his local pol police department. This was... If you notice in the, chat, in the bulletin, my responsibility is the charge to the candidate. Gloria and I look back over 30 years ago, and we received a phone call from Krista. Mom, there's this guy named Matt, and he's a great communicator. And we said to one another, I think we're going to be hearing a lot about this guy named Matt. And Matt, the more we have come to know you, 
the longer we have come to know you, the more we've come to love and appreciate you. After all, what more would a parent want than that their son-in-law would love the Lord and love their daughter? So this is the charge to the candidate. Theoretically, an older, wiser man is supposed to be sharing counsel with a younger man. He has 26 years of track record of loving you and leading you and nurturing you. So maybe what we should do is we should switch places. But instead, what we're going to do, we're going to tune into a podcast of a master teacher who's conducting a pastor seminar. Now, I want you to understand, as I get ready to do this, Dave Warren and I have not talked at all, none, about this. But God the Holy Spirit apparently talked to both of us. I think you can guess where we're headed. We only have a synopsis of this pastor seminar, but it is Paul conducting the seminar for the pastors at Ephesus. So you can go back to Acts chapter 20. (laughs) And I don't think that's an accident because God the Holy Spirit doesn't make any mistakes. So Paul is wrapping up his message. Probably the last time he's ever going to see these pastors. And he challenges them. And again, I'm going to pick it up with verse 28. It's starting at exactly the same text that God laid upon Dave's heart. Would I just find interesting? But in this passage, we're going to go verses 28 through 32. God is challenging these pastors, be alert. Be alert. First of all, as you look at verse 28... He says to us, and the print's a little small and my reading glasses are not with me, but I'm going to do it. He says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. There is, first of all, Matt, and for you as a church to hear, there is a requirement. Be alert. God is sovereign. He has a right to tell us what to do. And that idea where he says, be on guard, is it be alert. It's like a person on sentry duty. I remember reading about a sentry who was on duty during the Vietnam War. And he heard movement out in the jungle and knew that the VC were in the area. And he gave the command, identify yourself, identify yourself. Nobody identified themselves. But he heard the motion in the jungle and he fired The next morning, they found a 500-pound tiger in that area. Uh, Another kind of enemy was stalking, but the sentry was alert. And he says, be on guard. And if I had written this, I would have put the word order differently. I would have said, be on guard to watch over the flock. Oh, by the way, take care of yourself. But God doesn't do that. He tells your pastor, be on guard for yourself. So I ask, what areas should I be on guard about? Obviously, spiritually. We are engaged in spiritual battles. We're battling for the souls and the hearts of men. So guard yourself spiritually. I used to go to ordination examinations all the time, and I was one who tended to ask a lot of questions. I had, I guess, a reputation for that. One of the questions I would ask was, what is your personal program? for reading scripture. And I would come home grieved sometimes because some pastors, well, I, I read a verse here and a verse there. Some guys never had a systematic way of reading through scripture for themselves. And I don't mean reading for your sermon prep. Uh, my custom was at morning at home, I would do my personal Bible reading. It may be the passages I was preaching on, but normally it was reading straight through the Bible or a study of a book or something, simply because if I didn't feed my soul, I would be ill-equipped to feed others. So guard yourself spiritually. Guard yourself physically. Uh, We, our bodies and our souls and our minds are connected. And so I've as the years have gone on, especially I think after having had triple bypass surgery, 
I emphasize guard yourself physically. Exercise, eat sensibly, relax. One of the things that is great about Matt and Krista, and you guys know this, they take vacations together as a family. And when I have talked to older pastors, and I guess I are one now, they all say, I wish I had taken my days off. I wish I had taken my full vacation each year. Uh, there's a word which we call recreation. That doesn't necessarily mean going out of the racquetball. It's recreation. Vacations are recreation. It's a time to invigorate your soul. So guard yourself physically, emotionally, all, all kinds of ways. And then you guard the flock. And notice he says, the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers. I know you folks at Faith Baptist Church think you voted to call Pastor Matt. Well, you didn't really do that. You merely recognized the God, the Holy Spirit was calling Pastor Matt. And then the scripture says you are an overseer, and that's made up of two words. One over, and the other is the word from which we got our word scope, microscope, telescope. You are to watch over, and it's a, it's a position of authority. It happens to be the word from which we've got our word episcopal or episcopalian. It's one of the three words used to describe the pastor. So God, first of all, Pastor Matt, Here's the requirement, be alert. Now, I appreciate the fact that God doesn't just tell me what to do. He tells me why to do it. Isn't that good? Because not only does he give you the requirement, he gives you the reason. And let me follow along in verse 29, and Dr. Warren alluded to, to this. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and men from among yourselves shall arise up with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore be alert, remembering that night and day with tears I did not stop warning each of you. There are dangers both from without and within. Uh, I was raised, as I said, in a secular home, but I can remember my dad was raised in a church that had some kind of a gospel witness. And from time to time, I would hear dad going through the house singing, Ferris, the Lord Jesus. It was that got home where I didn't really broach the topic, but I wondered about it. But the culture in which we are now immersed, a hundred some years later than when my dad was born, is certainly not a Christian friendly culture. The entertainment media, educational, political agenda, it's not a friendly place. But you remember Isaac Watts wrote a song, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? And in that song he says, this world is not a friend to grace. It was not a friend to grace at Isaac Watts' time. It's not a friend to grace now. So understand, there are dangers from outside. You have to be alert. So as Dr. Warren says, you can teach and warn and protect. But it also, from within. You, you folks are willing to admit this, aren't you? that every single person in this room is a depraved sinner. Yeah. And I'm reminded of words attributed to Charles Spurgeon. I won't get them exact, but he said, be gentle with your critics, for you are far worse than they imagine you to be. Mm -hmm. And I think amongst yourselves realize you need to follow, as Dr. Warner said, Matt's leadership and teaching, because our sin natures get us going all kinds of directions. It seems to me with Facebook and TikTok and all these other social media platforms, we have seen polarization and division in every arena of life. So God tells me what to do. Be alert. It's a requirement. He tells you why. There are dangers from without and within. Now, the third thing I appreciate about God's leadership, he tells me what to do, he tells me why to do it, and then he gives me the resources to do it. And look at verse 32, which I just shut my Bible, so I'll open it again, so that rather than quoting it from my ancient memory, I will read it to you. But take a look at verse 32. Matt had his favorite verse read. This is my favorite verse. This is a verse I have based my heart upon. He says, and now I commit you to God 
and of the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. God doesn't just tell you as pastor, be alert. He doesn't just say, it's a dangerous world spiritually and emotionally. He also says, by the way, here are the resources for defending yourself. And it is first and foremost an intimate walking relationship with God. When Alvin read that brief biography, my college roommate from where I went to undergrad school, went to the University of Michigan, he wrote me about this relationship with God through Christ, and I thought he was nuts. He'd never been religious, so what was wrong with him now? So I hopped a bus from St. Louis up to Grand Rapids. He witnessed to me all night long, and in, in the 60s, evangelism often looked at salvation as what we call the fire escape from hell. You know, trust Jesus, you won't go, you'll go to heaven and everything will be fine. My friend Bob emphasized a growing, learning, intimate walk with God through faith in Christ. And I think to me that was such a critical factor. The other factor that was so critical was I could see he was a changed person. So God says, I commend you to God. And it's interesting, that word in verse 32, he says, I commit you to God. That is the same word spoken by our Savior when he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I think it's kind of neat that God used exactly the same word in both places. So, Pastor Matt, we commit you to God. And for you as a church family, in your own personal lives, commit yourself to God and to the word of his grace. When Gloria, when I first came to know Christ as a Savior, I started attending a local church, and I met a student nurse named Gloria, and we eventually got married. There was a dear elderly lady in our church, Beulah Lehman. Beulah Lehman had been voted out of three churches because Beulah Lehman was a reader of the Word of God. She was a student of Scripture. And as her church that she was attending began to deviate in her own quiet, gracious, respectful way, she would share her concerns. And the church didn't want to hear her concerns, voted her out. But Gloria and I said, walking into Vula's house, it was as though you were in the foyer to heaven. That, that building, that house had only been owned by believers. And there was just a special atmosphere about the place. So... I commit you to God and to the word of his grace because it is notice, it is able to build us up. One of the things we've seen in current American society is a tremendous emphasis. It really is a growth business, physical fitness, healthy eating, and all the rest of that. Well, that's nothing new. God has told us about health, but he says, I want to commit you to the word of his grace. This is how you feed your soul. And again, I, I'm concerned. I have so, so many pastor friends that, or acquaintances, I guess I couldn't call them friends, who did not have systematic scripture in their hearts. But there are others who, and Dr. Warren certainly one of them, you can tell the scripture just permeates his heart. And notice it builds us up, gives us an inheritance. We are, and Paul said to the church in Corinth, just look at yourselves, folks. You're not most of you rich. You're not most of you famous. You're not most of you prominent. But God has chosen us ordinary people. But we have an inheritance. Yeah, remember, there's that old song in the hymnal, I'm a child of the king. And we can rejoice. So it is a joy and delight. It, it is the highest of privileges for us to have been able to participate today. We knew he was special all along. And we have all kinds of stories we could tell you, but we won't. <laughs> but I can say he has a 26 year track record. You know what you're getting. And you're getting a good man. You've had a good man and a good woman all these years. And Krista didn't always enjoy growing up in a pastor's home. But just like some kids have street smarts, she had church smarts. She had just had absorbed what ministry was about. And that's not due to her father. It is due to her mother who had such a wonderful and continues to have a wonderful influence. But we're delighted. This is a great day. It's been a, it's a joy 
we sort of shouted at home too when we heard that there was going to be a vote. <laughs> so Matt, be alert. I don't know you are, but just continue to do so. admit it's it's a little difficult to respond <laughs> part of um, part of an installation service is for the new pastor to respond in some form or fashion and I just want to express my gratitude first of all to um, special guests I'd like to express my, my gratitude to uh, Dr. Warren for being here. I know that there were other places that you could have been this morning. Uh, his, uh, one of his granddaughters is getting baptized this morning. And so uh, his wife, Pat, wasn't able to be with us as, as she is um, there celebrating their daughter's baptism and commitment to the Lord. Um, but I count that an incredible uh, privilege to have you here this morning and share uh, Dr. Warren was, was both a professor as I was at Cedarville University, but also did, I don't know if you remember this, but you did our premarital counseling. So he must have done a great job. We're still together. <laughs> and so thank you so much for, for all your mentorship and involvement in, in our lives. And I want to thank um, my, my mom and dad. Don't do that, mom. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and Dad, for being a part of this this morning, um, for sharing your heart, and, uh, and for saying yes and giving permission uh, to have your daughter's hand in marriage as well. So I want to thank you for that. But I want to thank you for, for participating this morning. There are faces here that I haven't seen for a few months, a few years, um, and there are folks that, um, that go way back to 26 years ago when Krista and I arrived uh, quite wet behind the ears. And so I want to thank you to begin with as, as I respond. I want to thank you, first of all, for welcoming us into a community that was very much new, not just new to us as we'd never been to Mount Vernon before, but new from a cultural standpoint. Both Chris and I grew up in, in a suburban, semi-urban area and we had no idea how quickly um, you could, in Mount Vernon, become front page news if you ran into an Amish buggy, <laughs> for example. Or, or how important it is to fit in by owning a 12-gauge shotgun. And so I thank you for, for embracing us despite, at the time, not having it and never having run into an Amish buggy until a few months into our ministry here. Thank you also for those who have been parents over the years uh, for entrusting us the ministry to your sons and to your daughters, um, especially during a time when we didn't even have our own kids. Uh, that must have been quite scary to entrust your kids to individuals that were only maybe four or five, six years older than your senior hire who was graduating that year, and to entrust them into our care and spiritual guidance uh, gave uh, and, and demonstrated tremendous trust in us. So thank you. Thank you for providing us with a family when we didn't have a family nearby. Uh, 12 hours, 11 hours from Des Moines, a uh, drive here from Mount Vernon, and my parents live in Germany, and so um, times for to spend time with family during holidays, uh, to celebrate our kids' births. I know there's a, there's a family here this morning 
Uh, I think they hung around Kroger's knowing my wife was having a C-section for our first baby and were anticipating that phone call so they could be, their daughters could be the first there in the hospital room. And so thank you for being our family when we didn't have family nearby. Um, thanks for providing food on holidays when we didn't know how to cook except for <laughs> mac and cheese for celebrating our birthdays with us, our anniversaries, and our graduations. Thanks also for being patient as we, we grew and forgiving us when we made mistakes, and we made lots of them. So thank you for forgiving us of those as well. Like I said, there's a lot of things we didn't know. Um, and didn't understand uh, about the world and what was going on. I remember even uh, filling the pulpit and saying some really, really goofy things. Uh, some of them were just idiom related. Um, sometimes I just got really, really excited in an, in an introduction and instead of making reference to an individual losing bodily control, I said they lost all bodily function. <laughs> and I appreciate just the congregation, even that morning, there was absolute silence. <laughs> and I remember looking at it and saying, in my head, I thought I said it in my head, but I accidentally, it came out of my lips. I said, that's not right. <laughs> and of course, at that point, everybody was uh, sliding <laughs> laughter. And finally, thank you for trusting us to serve in this new capacity and this calling. We are so grateful for that. I am, I am so excited to be working across the hall with somebody whom I love to do ministry with. I don't know, Alvin, where you're at, um, but it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a joy to be um, across the hall from you and dream and be used to the Lord. Um, thanks for being my uh, Asian compadre there in the office. I really appreciate it. And... Um, uh, to share ministry with um, the elders here at Faith Baptist Church that function like Paul and like Barnabas in many ways. And so I'm grateful for them. And, and finally, um, to be able to lead a team of deacons that really wears service on their sleeve, that truly continue to understand and develop in their role as deacons. So deacons, and, and as you function as a pulpit committee, thank you so much for, for serving alongside. And nevertheless, this morning I have to say, um, when I have received the phone call after the special business meeting, and the guys told me the outcome of the vote, I told them ahead of time what I was anticipating in order to accept the call um, it was a very quick response based on the percentage. Uh, Fifteen minutes later, though, I said to myself, what in the world did I get myself into? <laughs> and that is not a reflection. It, it's not a reflection on, on my church family, the church family here at Faith Baptist Church whatsoever. It is instead this overwhelming understanding that I am not adequate for this task. Um, that I tell myself I don't know enough. That people, because you've been a youth pastor for 26 years, won't be taken seriously. And to be honest with you, I'm never really not that good at wor with words. Yeah, see, at words, right? With words. And I think back to Exodus chapter 3 and 4, and I think those were all Moses' questions and excuses. And in the end, it's all about surrendering to God in our inadequacies. Because our goal ultimately, right, is, is not about an individual unless that individual is Jesus Christ himself and to glorify him and to honor him and entrust and obey him. The bottom line, as was read earlier, 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and to paraphrase it a little bit, we're everyday dishes. We're not the fine china. We are jars of clay. And as jars of clay, it draws attention to the fact that the unsurpassing or all-surpassing power of the gospel comes from God and not from us as individuals. God, may he be glorified in the midst here at Faith Baptist Church. Amen? We may be and we will be hard-pressed. We will be perplexed. We will be persecuted. We will be struck down. There will be difficult times. But nevertheless, Paul says in that passage, we will not be crushed. We will not despair. Praise the Lord, we will not be abandoned nor destroyed because we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. So we are all, if we know Christ as our personal Savior, we are first of all and foremost a child of God. Some of you are husbands and wives second. And in my case, third, I'm a pastor. May God always be glorified. May God always be glorified through our life. I want to close with this commitment. I commit to faithfully preach the whole counsel of the word of God in order to feed you and encourage you to hunger for more. I will lead you by being a personal example of holiness and a gospel witness in every part of my life. I also commit to praying for you fervently and to seek to love you as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a family. I will do everything in my power to shepherd you, to guard you, to protect you from false teaching and false teachers. And lastly, I will determine to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified that God might receive all the glory. I'd like to invite the elders. It's a great day to celebrate what God is doing. Amen. Amen. He is alive and we are his. I, um, I'm reminded at this moment as we gather around Pastor Matt for the laying on of hands of several passages of scripture that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote to his protege Timothy where he encourages him and reminds him about the laying on of hands of the elders in the church. And as we come to this moment, I'd like to just give a few words of explanation. First of all, there is nothing mysterious about the laying on of hands. It's a simple way of recognizing the, un, the invisible and making it visible. Uh, it's a way of bringing the unknown to reality, to make it known. It's a way of honoring Jesus Christ. And I'd like to ask, uh, as the elders are up here, and I'd like to encourage the deacons uh, just to stand where they are, uh, if you would, please. And, and this is just a show of unity as we uh, lay our hands on uh, Pastor Matt. Would you uh, bow with me in prayer? Okay, you want to that? Okay. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, creator and sustainer of the universe, El El Yan. We come here this morning with humble and thankful hearts. Humble that through the precious and precious name of Jesus Christ,
we can come with boldness into your very presence, Elohim, the majestic, transcendent, holy God of creation, and yet thankful for your grace, mercy, and love. And we are thankful for Jesus Christ, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, the one who is intimately involved, who right now, at this very moment, is right in the midst of what's happening. Father, we come in a spirit of prayer and dependence upon you with a particular request this morning. As Paul writes to Timothy, for this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. May this be your servant's experience. Lord, guide Pastor Matt and direct him as he seeks to lead your people. Make him a wise and able teacher. Fill him with your love that he may tend your flock eagerly and willingly. Lord, give him a deeper sensitivity and an unquenchable thirst for righteousness, a more seeing spirit after your word. Father, keep him faithful in times of testing, humble in times of success, and joyful at all times in your service. Enable us, Father, as a congregation, to serve you as you deserve, to encourage and support Pastor Matt and his family as is becoming a divinely appointed elder, to give and not to count the cost, to fight, toil, and labor without complaint, to serve in oneness of mind, and to seek no reward except in our knowing that we are doing your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Would the whole congregation please stand as we close our service together in honor of the Lord. We're going to have the praise team lead us in, in one more song and then I'll close in prayer.
Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as, as our time corporately here in this place draws to a close and we, as the church, go our separate ways into our homes, into our workplaces this week, my prayer is that truly each individual light would illumine the darkness through the work of your Holy Spirit in us. We pray that this would be a church that is on mission. We pray that the family of God might truly demonstrate that they are part of your family by the love that they have for one another. We pray, Lord, that you would again impress upon us, the church, what it means to be adopted sons and daughters of the Most High to whom we just sang. We thank you that we represent the temple, a spiritual house made up of spiritual living stones. And Lord, may whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, may we do all these things for your glory and to worship you, to make much of your name. We thank you that, Lord, we are that are part of your family, that are part of the church, are chosen before the foundations of the world, and that you call us beloved. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray that, Lord, you would again unite us, not around the fellowship of food or a meal, of similar interests, oneness that we have that is found only in Christ and in Christ alone. We pray, Lord, that we would never depart from your inspired word, that truly from this pulpit, the truth would always be, always be communicated unapologetically. And that, Lord, when we gather together, when we open up the word, it would stir us to want more. And Heavenly Father, we pray that Faith Baptist Church would fulfill and we a part of the Great Commission, that we truly would go and we would make disciples of all nations, that one day around your throne will be gathered people from every tribe, tongue, people, nation. Lord, may that be our priority. Father, I pray that we would be a force to be reckoned with at the gates of hell. And Lord, we pray that Again, you would be pleased by the way that we love both you as well as people. Send us out with that commission this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Um, we'd love to, especially for some of you that we haven't seen in a while, which I know Krista and I would love to, to connect before you leave today. I know it's noon um, and maybe you have a lunch date. Um, but uh, we'd love to connect with you before you leave. So thanks for coming today. Lord bless you.